Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Central Confinement Services webinar, um, the legislative update on meat inspection. First off, I'd like to make sure everyone can hear me okay. And if you can, if you want to get started by just dropping your name and state in the chat box where we will have questions available to be asked and just kind of get started from there. So thank you everyone. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself first and introduce who's speaking back here. Uh, my name is Hannah Esch and I'm a member of the marketing team here at Central Confinement Service. I'm a fifth generation cattleman and I, on the side I also sell beef directly to consumers. So this conversation is near and dear to my heart and I'm really looking forward to hearing what Laura Field has to say today. Um, Laura is the leg legislative coordinator for the Nebraska Department of Agriculture and has been a big advocate for the agricultural community in Nebraska for eight years. So Laura, I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me as well. We did a little test before everybody got on, so hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, as Hannah said, my name's Laura Field. I work for the Nebraska Department of Agriculture. Um, really happy to be on this afternoon and um, look forward to moving through my presentation quickly and getting to some questions you all may have. A little bit about me. Um, my husband and I came to Nebraska eight years ago. Uh, he teaches over at the University of Nebraska, and um, I spent five years working for Nebraska Cattlemen prior to starting with the department in uh, December just of last year. So I handle the department's legislative work. I'm the liaison between the office and um, the state legislature, so I get to be involved in the issues that we have on our legislative agenda. Um, I was raised on a a, a seed stock um, purebred cattle operation on the Gulf Coast of Texas. Um, my brother and dad run the show there now and uh, they're fifth and sixth generation of our family to run the ranch. Uh, my husband's family owns a ranch in the um, mountains of Colorado. So uh, I went from uh, my undergrad in Texas on to Colorado State to get a master's degree and then uh, came to Nebraska. So I've been working in the, I just kind of call it the advocacy space for the agricultural industry, primarily the livestock sector, uh, most of my career, but really happy to get a chance to advocate for um, the agricultural industry in Nebraska and, and happy and, and thankful to Hannah for asking me to be a part of this today. Well, thank you, Laura. And as everyone I'm sure can tell, you're more than qualified to be our guest speaker today regarding the legislation of meat inspection and mainly in the state of Nebraska, but across the country too. Um, this will be a great conversation. I'm looking forward to the educational opportunities for producers and processors and anybody else on this call today. So before we begin the presentation, I would like to quickly introduce Central Confinement Service. Um, we've had over 35 years of experience in working with livestock producers CCS is the expert in commercial construction, and we build livestock housing systems, uh, general commercial construction, and even processing facilities. So we're truly built on a simple concept, which is service is our business and growth is yours. And we offer services from start to finish and are honored to serve as a one-stop shop for construction. So we offer pre-project planning that starts with design and permitting to the construction phase and management with project scheduling and even post-construction maintenance and warranty service. CCS can truly handle it all. So before we get started here, uh, a quick note. If you have any questions or would like to speak about, with CCS about our services after the webinar, please contact us and visit our website. And we'd absolutely love to hear from you for all aspects. And we will be doing a live question and answer session at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions through the webinar, just type them in that chat box that we mentioned in the beginning and we'll answer them in the end. So let's get started with our expert guests with more information on meat inspection. So first, Laura, I'd like if we could get into a brief explanation of how the current inspection process works. Yes, absolutely. And um, I appreciate Hannah calling me an expert. She and I have had a number of conversations about this and I 
Um, one of the things that I have been asked a lot, this has been a, a, a huge topic, especially with um, all of the slowdowns we've seen with COVID, but um, I, it's been kind of a fun thing for me to get back into when I was an undergraduate, I was on the meets judging team, um, had never done anything like that before, but traveled all over the country. Um, in fact, it was my first time coming to Nebraska was when I got to come practice in some of the plants here. So I feel like I'm kind of going back to my college days to dust off the cobwebs on this topic. So I have spent quite a bit of time talking um, to other experts in the field and really trying to get in tune with where this thing is headed. But just a little bit of background, as Hannah said, um, in 1906, uh, the federal government put in place the Federal Meat Inspection Act. Much of that was uh, the result of the book, The Jungle, that was written by Upton Sinclair that really talked about what the packing industry was like. Um, and at the time, President Roosevelt's um, direction to kind of get things regulated. And so um, in 1906, the Federal Meat Inspection Act and the, the Poultry Inspection Act both went into place. Um, and so that sort of led us to the, the situation that we're in today. These laws have been on the books for a long time at the federal level. And we kind of have four different categories. And I'm just going to kind of hit the highlights of them. And we're going to talk through specifically kind of what that means, what, where those plants are and what that looks like um, as we get into more detail. But um, under the current system, um, there are federally inspected plants that are regulated by the Food Safety Inspection Service, FSIS. Um, there are about 6,400 of those federally inspected operations uh, in the 50 states, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, and Puerto Rico. So there's quite a bit of, um, you can tell that's a, a pretty big number um, for those plants. And, um, oh, thank you, Hannah. Um, there, that product, that's, that's the broadest category of inspection. Um, to be in that category, you have to have continuous inspection at those facilities. Um, product that is produced there, you'll see on the map that's on your screen right now, these are the green states or those that participate in FSIN's S inspection, which Nebraska would be one of those. Um, any product produced there can be sold um, interstate uh, and international and in, 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 in anywhere in the country and internationally. So there's no limitations on the sales there for commerce. Um, those facilities have to meet the um, facility food safety standards and have to be a designated facility um, a federal inspector is there all times, both anti-mortem uh, during the slaughter process to make sure that the plant is following the humane slaughter requirements and during the inspection. So both the live animals are checked, the, the processes it's gone through and, and, and all the way through. Um, the product that comes out of those plants, if you've ever had something from there, has a federal stamp of inspection to prove that it came from there. Um, one other little note that's not on this slide, but is important to talk about, for plants that are FSIS inspected, 100% of the cost of those inspectors is borne by um, the federal government, by USDA, FSIS. They get a, an appropriation every year. So except for overtime fees, um, which are paid for by user fees or a fee that you would get charged by the facility, 100% of the cost of those inspectors is, is covered. So that's one of the, I guess you could say, perks of, of that level of inspection. Um, the second category of um, inspection is what we call uh, general state inspected or uh, meet uh, MPI, which is an agreement between the federal government and the states. This, um, these programs came into place in um, the 1960s when the federal meat inspection law was expanded to allow for states to be able to have a program. Um, before that, there was kind of a patchwork of states. Um, you'll see on this map, the green states are those that have a state MPI program. You'll notice two light green states, South Dakota and Georgia. Um, those, those states only have a federal or a state meat inspection program. All the dark green states have both a state meat and poultry inspection. So you can divide those out. Um, I should also clarify that while there is a poultry processing inspection act, um, I'm mostly gonna be sticking on the, the meat side today, um, which is the area we've had the most conversation about in the state, I would say, as far as what options are available. Um, products produced in a state inspected facility um, can only be sold intrastate, so only within the state's borders. You can't sell them internationally, you can't sell them outside of the state, um, with an exception that I'll talk about here in a second, but for the most part, that's the way they can be sold. Again, the facilities have to meet um, the same standards. You have to produce that product at, at least equal to what the federal requirements are. So. Um, when your state puts a program in place, it can't be a less than standard. You have to still meet all those same requirements. Um, states enter into an, a cooperative agreement 
Um, they make the request to the federal government. Um, that process can take any length of time. Um, generally, it takes one to two years to get a state program online, but there are states that have said it's, it's taken them even longer. It just kind of depends on how quickly um, they've got their, their state laws in place, how quickly they've got inspectors and the labor force ready to go. Um, in a state inspected facility, a state inspector would be present at all times, similar to a federal plant with a federal inspector, and um, there would be a state stamp of inspection instead of a federal um, stamp of inspection. So pretty much similar, except that you can only sell within your state's borders. Um, the third type of, um, of an inspection oversight would be a federal state cooperative. This is, um, in parentheses, you'll see the TA, which stands for Talmadge Aiken. It was a, a federal act passed back in 2004. Um, there's only 10 states that participate in this. Um, you'll see those highlighted in green here. And um, these are states where it's kind of a hybrid. So they're, they're operating under federal inspection, but if the federal government has made an agreement with the state where the state inspectors can actually um, do the work of the inspection. Um, I want to go back quickly too. Don't you don't have to go back to the slide, Hannah, but just to, to let you know on a state inspected facility, the federal government covers 50% of the inspector's cost. So I told you with federal government, they pay 100% on a state inspected facility. It's a cost share of 50 50. So the state has to provide 50% of that um, payment there. Um, so a Talmadge Aiken plant or a, a federal state cooperative plant. Again, it's under federal inspection that the state inspectors are actually doing the work. There's an agreement entered into. Um, all the same requirements take place there as do with the federal inspection, including the inspectors being there, and a federal inspection stamp that um, goes out on those products um, as well when they come out of the plant. And then the final sort of category would be what's called a cooperative interstate shipment agreement. This is what I was talking about with the state plants with a, a quote unquote exception. Um, so the facilities that participate here, and this is done once a state is approved to enter into a cooperative interstate shipping agreement, the individual plants would apply to be eligible. So um, these are in states where there is a state meat inspection program. So you have to have a state program. Um, and then establishments can apply. These are small establishments with 25 or fewer employees. Um, and they enter into an agreement where they are then allowed to sell outside of the state's border. So they would not be limited to just intrastate. They could sell across state lines. Um, there's a lot of paperwork involved with this and some tracking that happens. Um, and, and again, only 10 states have it. The, the most recent state to come online was Iowa, so our neighboring state to the east. Um, and, you know, a pretty developed program where, like I said, the record keeping is pretty key. And then once the product goes out the door there, there's a federal stamp of inspection um, that has an SE on it and the state's uh, abbreviation. So it's, it's kind of proof that it comes through this hybrid system, which helps with tracking if there were to be a recall um, from a product that came out of one of these facilities. Um, this is just a little chart, um, just to be helpful to just kind of show you the differences on how, um, the systems work just with general things as far as what are the requirements, um, who inspects the facilities, what is what is available. The, the final column where it says available markets, the key to that is it's one of the conversations that's really led us to where some of the discussion has gone today as far as um, people wanting to have products sold more directly to consumers or processed in a different way. You still have to make sure that you're able to be in the right category to be able to sell that product and it has to come through um, one of these official um, inspected programs because um, the duty of FSIS is to is to protect the, the nation's food supply. So um, anyway, this is just kind of a good little cheat sheet. We've used it here in our office as we've tried to kind of explain practically uh, in one simple slide kind of how this looks. So um, good little reference back for you on how um, how the process kind of works for each of the different categories. So, Laura, you mentioned that Nebraska falls into that uh, federal inspected category. Do they fall into any of these other three? So, we do not. We are solely um, a, a federally designated state right now. Nebraska did have a state meat inspection program in the 70s, in the early 70s. Um, it was discontinued because of um, the cost of the program without really 
seeing a lot of benefit. You still had to be equal to the federal program. So many of those operations that were um, state inspected were going ahead and getting federal inspection because they were able to sell even further, um, you know, outside of the state line. So we only are um, on the top line of this chart. This that would be what applies to Nebraska today. Um, you know, if we if we had a state program, we could potentially enter into um, a cooperative shipping agreement. But as of right now. The state does not have inspection, um, nor are we seeking to put it in place. And I can talk a little bit about that as we go through some of the other slides too, um, just as far as other ways where we feel like we could be helpful to consumers looking to get into this or operations looking to broaden their sales of, of products as well. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. That is the perfect segue to our next slide, which is um, there was a recent resolution introduced during this legislative session that may change Nebraska's meat inspection requirements. Can you talk a little bit about LR380? Yes, so just um, just last week on Friday, uh, so we're in a we're in the a short period, the legislature adjourned in May. Um, we were in the short session this year, uh, which is a 60 day session, but they adjourned abruptly in March, not May, excuse me, um, when things kind of shut down due to COVID-19. And so they came back last week for their final 17 days. And during this period of time, they can introduce, uh, they cannot introduce any new bills without a suspension of the rules, but they can introduce interim studies. So on Friday, Senator Tom Brewer uh, and a group of other senators who signed on as co-sponsors introduced LR 380. Senator Brewer represents the, the large majority of, out, of Western counties, um, big area of cattle country out in the Western part of the state. And um, his office has had a lot of conversations with constituents during COVID about some of the challenges they face with not being able to get animals scheduled at facilities and, and kind of some of the challenges they felt. So they've introduced a resolution um, calling on uh, the industry to kind of come together and talk about what could a program in Nebraska look like? One of the things that Senator Brewer has said is that he doesn't want to um, have negative implications on food safety and have any problems in that respect, and also um, doesn't want to see something that would cost the state um, money. Um, obviously, the state's resources are pretty um, challenged, like everybody else's resources right now. So he's hoping that he could figure out a way to come up with a potential solution without um, a general fund impact. One of the things that I think the goal of the interim study is, as I've read it, is, is to bring interested parties to the table, be it cattle producers, processors, um, whether it's somebody who actually owns a facility, um, is thinking about building a facility, or someone who's involved in an online direct sale company. Um, many producers today in Nebraska sell sides of, um, you know, work with work with consumers to say, hey, do you want to buy a side of beef? And they make those arrangements on the live animal side. I'll talk a little bit about custom processing in a second and how that is different from what we're talking about. But um, the interim study would just be a chance for people to come together and see if there's some areas of agreement and also to address where are the concerns and what might be some challenges as far as what it would look like to put a program in place. And so no firm, um, dates have been selected for it. It'll be something probably usually with interim studies as we get into the fall, they bring people together, but they'll um, have to make a public announcement about when they're going to have a, a discussion and a hearing and those those kind of meetings are open to the public. So um, definitely you can watch the legislature's website and, and if anybody has questions after this, um, I can certainly stay in touch with Hannah about it and, and share information on when that potential hearing will be. Um, it'll be a good way to hear what people are thinking. Great, thanks for explaining that. And there's another um, act that has been introduced into um, government that's helping us combat some of those same issues that you had just talked about. And those are the Prime Act, Direct Act, and Ramp Up Act. Um, can you just go through each one of those and, and explain them a little bit? Yeah, so all of these are um, acts that have been introduced at the federal level, um, so in Congress or in the US Senate. Um, one thing that I want to make clear, because I probably have made this about as clear as mud so far. So in the state with us having federally inspected plants, we also have a number of custom processors. Nebraska has a pretty vibrant custom meat processor um, group and those facilities that are custom exempt is what they're called. Um, they are inspected annually. They are still expected to meet sanitation and safety um, 
protocols and not sell unadulterated product, but they are not under continuous inspection. Product from those facilities can only be sold to the actual producer or his household, his or her household, or non-paying guests that they might have in their household. So, um, you know, a cattle producer takes his, his steers to the local custom processor. The product is stamped with a stamp that says not for sale and they make the arrangements and they come pick them up and they take them back and put them in their freezer. Um, under, under that framework in Nebraska, um, me as a consumer could go to that rancher and say, I would like to buy a half of a beef from you. I would pay that rancher for the half of beef. I would make the arrangements with the custom slaughter facility. They would cut it to my liking and then I would go pick it up and pay for it there. That is all allowed under the custom processing exemption, um, which I just wanted to kind of make clear because some of these acts are attempting to make some changes to the custom um, exempt laws. So let's talk about the Prime Act first because that's the one that probably addresses that the most. Um, the Prime Act is something that has, it, it stands for Processing Revival and Interstate Meat Exemption Act. Um, this has actually been introduced a couple of different times at the federal level. Um, it is it has been introduced um, this year it was introduced by uh, representative Thomas Massey who is from Kentucky um, there is a, a companion bill over in the Senate as well um, and the the goal of this act has been to allow for products at those custom exempt facilities to be sold only at the intrastate level so again only within the state's borders where it produced so it would be a massive deviation from current practices and current law um, it would require a change to the Federal Meat Inspection Act, but it would allow um, those products that are coming from a, a facility that is not continuously inspected to then be sold. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around what's the magic of those facilities as far as inspection. A lot of us buy product from custom exempt facilities. We are totally comfortable eating that in our homes, we're totally comfortable, you know, serving it to our friends. But when it comes to inspection and a product like meat, um, a meat carcass, a live animal that could come in sick, um, under the Federal Meat Inspection Act, it is to be sold into commerce, it has to come from a federal or state inspected facility. So this would be a, a pretty significant change. One of the things that has been a question mark with this bill, and it has been assigned to a committee, but there's not been any action taken, um, there, one of the concerns that have been raised by some of the, the national livestock groups is um, what impacts could this have on food safety? There's, there's a lot of unknowns around that, but even more so, one of the pieces that's unknown is if, if a bill like this passed in Congress, states would then likely have to pass some kind of law sort of allowing them to now be able to do this. Many, most states are either in or out when it comes to federal meat inspection, and so you'd have to um, probably more than likely come up with a, a new sort of state scheme to, to have some legislative changes. The other thing that's been raised because um, product, when we make trade agreements with other countries under the, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, we are not allowed to essentially discriminate. So we can't, we can't have a different standard for product produced in the, in the United States than what we would expect from somewhere else. And so there's been some question marks raised again just questions and discussion. If we were to have um, certain products being allowed to be sold into commerce that were coming from a non-inspected facility, would we be in violation of some of our trade agreements since we are telling other countries, we need to have your products inspected before we're willing to take them. So um, some question marks around that, but it, this has been one of those that is definitely, I would say growing, um, growing enthusiasm is kind of growing around it because people recognize that right now, um, more people are wanting to buy product with stuff being short in the grocery store or you know some plants slowing down a little bit so definitely an act that um, has been discussed quite a bit um, and i would anticipate anticipate that will continue as far as the prime act um, the next one that is um, been introduced is called the direct act so the direct interstate retail exemption for certain transactions act um, there was a there was an act prior to this one being introduced that was called the um, New Markets Act. And so they're kind of a similar, essentially the goal of this would be to allow those state inspected plants. So when, when I talked about that earlier and said a state inspected plant can only sell intrastate, this bill would make an exception and now say, if you have a state program, you can sell that product all over the country. 
You can sell it through e-commerce. You can sell it direct to consumers. Um, you would not just have to sell it within your state's borders. And so, um, again, there would be some new record keeping requirements. Um, it has been very well received. It was introduced by, um, in the U.S. House by Dusty Johnson, who is a um, South Dakota representative, and Henry Quaylar, who is from Texas. So it's been kind of a bipartisan Republican-Democrat uh, bill that was introduced. But again, it was introduced really in response to um, COVID-19 challenges to say these state inspection plants are already meeting the federal requirements and they have to meet the equal to standard. So why don't we expand for them to be sold in a broader, in a broader way? Um, this bill also is still just in the introduced and been assigned to a committee process. Um, I am not an expert on how bills move through Congress. Um, I've only ever really worked at the state level, but um, you know, in working with industry counterparts, I know there's a lot of positive momentum for this bill, but nothing, nothing, you know, is set in stone with it, with, with it yet. But I anticipate, again, that that will continue to grow. Um, and then the third piece, uh, the third bill that just got introduced, this one was just introduced a couple of weeks ago, is called the Ramp Up Act. Uh, this is called, this stands for Requiring Assistance to Meet Processors for Upgrading Plants. Um, I am personally very intrigued and professionally very intrigued. Um, Director Wellman, who is our director here at the Nebraska Department of Agriculture, participates with other state agriculture directors um, in calls on a number of timely issues that the states are facing. And there was a working group with this state departments of agriculture group that was talking about this particular subject and how could they help some of their plants in their states. And so this bill came as a direct response of some of those discussions. Um, and it was introduced by uh, the chairman of the House Agriculture Committee, Colin Peterson, who's from Minnesota, and Frank Lucas, who is the former chairman of that committee, who's from Oklahoma. Um, a number of, of folks have joined in that introduction, including Jeff Fortenberry, one of our um, representatives here in Nebraska. And so the, the goal of this piece of legislation, which has been received incredibly well right now by the industry as a whole, would be to make available a pool of money for plants um, to upgrade their facilities and work towards becoming federally inspected. So a plant could apply for up to a $100,000 grant. And there's, I think there's $80 million in the pool of money so far. Um, they would apply for that money and have up to 36 months to get their plant upgraded and online. So again, they could use it for equipment. They could upgrade their facilities if they needed a new sanitation system or a you know, hot water system to be put in. Um, many states, when the, the Federal CARES Act was passed to help support states that were struggling, many states took some of their state allotment of money and gave um, a pool of money towards small processors. But we really think here in Nebraska that this would be well received by processors who were looking to upgrade um, and potentially get into you know, a regulated system if they were custom exempt right now. So um, brand new introduced, but very well received by you know, American Farm Bureau, National Cattlemen's, um, the, uh, a lot of the other um, organizations, American or National Pork Producers, American Farmers Union. So lots of groups out there that are supporting this act and really thinking that it would be a benefit. So anxious to see how that maybe moves forward. Thanks for explaining each one of those. And I know you touched a little bit on this already, but the wanting to go into the interpretation of um, the Federal Meat Inspection Act and Poultry Products Inspection Act um, from the Nebraska Department of Agriculture perspective. Yeah, and this is one where, again, as I said earlier, um, the Department is not currently looking to um, put in, in place a state program. Now, clearly, if the legislature were to have that discussion, um, you know, you can look through, and we've looked through a lot of things um, with what other states pay for those programs because of the state's cost to pay for inspectors. Um, it's probably a minimum of a, of a couple of million dollars worth of investment. Um, and again, every state would say their state budgets are tight, are certainly as here too. So. Um, you know, it would be something that would be a much broader conversation. It would take probably a few years to get one in place. And if you were wanting to go down the path of being an inspected facility, you're, you're able to today go down, the, go down that road when it comes to federal inspection. So because they're equal um, and because you can sell more broadly under federal inspection, um, you know, the, the department has had a lot of these discussions, but is certainly open to listening. But as with most things, it comes down to how, how could we pay for this? 
Um, but we've looked at these acts and we've, um, we've had a lot of questions as we've come through things with COVID. Um, again, and, and I won't read these verbatim, but certainly um, there's daily inspection is required at these plants in order to have a USDA um, inspection stamp put on them, which is something that is important when it comes to commerce. Again, um, meat is a product that is, um, you know, susceptible to foodborne pathogens getting involved. We want to make sure that we're keeping people safe. Anytime there's a foodborne illness outbreak, it does none of us any good. It's hard for producers. It's hard for the industry to recover. So we certainly want to make sure we're protecting the United States has had the safest food supply um, for so long and has always been seen that way. We certainly don't want to see that changed. Um, product, one of the questions we've had asked a lot um, that's pretty important to clarify is product that is produced um, under a custom exemption, so as I talked about that earlier with the plants that aren't continuously inspected, product from, from those plants cannot be sold or donated. We've had a lot of questions, you know, I've got a steer, can I take it to a custom plant? Can it be donated to a food pantry? Um, the answer has been no. The same goes for um, school, the school feeding programs. Um, Nebraska has a pretty vibrant beef in school program where a lot of producers have gotten involved with their schools. Um, those livestock that go through, um, cattle that go through to be served in those schools have to be processed at an inspected facility. Um, that's all part of the federal law. So we've had to really have some tough conversations about that because it would make sense. Hey, can we donate it? But um, it cannot be. Any product that goes into commerce has to come from an inspected facility. Um, federal law is clear that personnel have to be conducting 100% carcass by carcass inspection. So this happens in shifts. It happens every day. Um, you know, Nebraska is pretty unique because we have we have small USDA inspected facilities that, that process 10 to 20 head a day, some that process 10 to 20 head a week, and then we have our super large facilities that process thousands a day. So we're kind of a unique um, state in that respect that we have we have facilities of all sizes. Um, the uh, those non inspected facilities again can't sell or donate that meat. So it's one of the big things that we've tried to really make sure that we're educating people on. And I would say that's one of the things we've really learned in this that there's a lot of information people don't know. And so as soon as we've talked about it, it's it's been a little bit more helpful. Um, we want to make sure, and FSIS has been very clear on every conversation I've been in with them that their main objective is to protect um, consumers and to make sure that our food supply is safe. And so. Um, you know, at this point, we do not get any indication that they're willing to see um, those regulations relaxed. Certainly, the agency can't change those regulations. Um, it would have to be done from a legislative change. So if there were going to be some change, it would have to be one of these bills that I just talked about or something else that would make that change. Um, one of the other things that I think is interesting, um, while there certainly were plants that closed and certainly plants that slowed down, um, in, in March and April, and there's even some that, um, you know, stayed slow for quite a while. In talking with um, the Food Safety Inspection Service, um, those plants did not close because of inspection personnel or lack thereof. Yes, there were lots of inspectors working overtime. There were shifting around to personnel. Oftentimes, it was workers within those facilities between sickness or um, you know, time taken off during, you know, fears with COVID, but we had some, we've had some questions come up that, you know, well, we can't get inspectors here, we can't get that, and, you know, FSIS's response has always been, let us know if that's the case, because um, during the slowdowns, none of the plants show closed just specifically because inspectors weren't available, so certainly an area where I think we could always use more inspectors, but that has definitely not been our understanding from them as far as how that, you um, you know, may or may not have worked out. So um, I think there's a there's some more points too on the next slide, Hannah. Um, yes. Oops. No, you're fine. Um, so I ha it's funny. I have it sitting on my desk in front of me too, but it's just easier to look at it on the screen. Um, you know, one of the things that um, I, I mentioned and um, just want to make sure I'm clear and happy to answer questions if I have made this a little bit fuzzy, but because a state program has to be equal to the federal program, um, you know, Nebraska has been very clear when we've had people call us and say, well, why don't we have state inspection? And we've really talked about the fact that um, in thinking about it, like what would we gain? Would certainly, you would certainly gain access to sell intrastate. 
but if a custom exempt facility wanted to be federally inspected today, they could make that application and then they could sell even more broadly. So making sure that we um, are doing, you know, what's best and what the industry is calling for. Um, there have been some studies in Nebraska in the past. Uh, the legislature has directed some studies. There have been some surveys of the industry asking what they would like to see changed. Um, there's plenty of custom lockers out there who say we don't want to be inspected. We do plenty of business with our local cattle producers. We're doing just fine. Um, those facilities also, just as a, an additional note, they can bring in uh, product that comes from a federally inspected plant. So they could bring in a beef round and grind that up into hamburger and sell it out of their facility as long as it has a federal inspection stamp when they get it. That's what grocery stores do in a lot of instances. But those custom lockers can also work through that way of processing, further processing that product. It just has to have originated from a federal inspection facility. So there's a lot of opportunities there, but certainly we want to make sure we hear from the industry um, before anybody went down a path that would, would be a new level of regulation without a doubt. Um, you know, the, the Federal Meat Inspection Act and the, the Poultry um, Processing Inspection Act are under constant review by FSIS. State programs are under that same review. So always there's oversight there and, you know, we're making sure, we want to make sure that we're not just adding additional burdens to people's businesses, but allowing them to be able to, to grow their businesses the way they really feel it, it makes the most sense. Um, there have been a lot of requests um, to make changes to these laws. I've been on a lot of calls with state departments of agriculture where they've been asking questions. But one of the concerns is what happens when it comes to traceability. Um, in a state where there's a state inspection program, without a change in the law right now, you're not allowed to sell it across state lines because the state's authority stops at the state line. Nebraska Department of Agriculture has no authority in the state of Iowa to regulate what they're selling over there. So we want to make sure that if a product is getting sold, and again, we don't have state inspections that wouldn't apply to us, but Iowa does. If the product that was sold from an Iowa state meat inspection facility was sold into Nebraska, um, the Iowa State Department of Agriculture really has no oversight into what is happening here in Nebraska. So we wanted to make sure and make it clear that because our authority stops at the state line, we have to make sure we're following the letter of the law. And if that law has changed, if, if one of these bills passes, if the direct act passes where you can now sell across state line, um, that's perfectly fine. We've been asked the question too, um, well, there's already companies that are selling internet sales all across the country. That is true. Um, and I'm not going to steal Hannah's thunder. She can certainly share her own business model, but the products that those companies are selling today have to be processed through a federally inspected facility. Um, that's the, that's the way that you can sell, um, across interstate, interstate lines. And so, um, those, there are a lot of those companies, they seem to be growing. And I think all of those companies are seeing a huge demand in product right now, but they are being processed. And so that's where some of the challenges come in because people are not able to find, rail space in a USDA facility. So that's where some of the pressure has been coming from these discussions. Um, but again, if there was a recall and we had to go recall product that was sold because someone got sick, um, we would need the authority to be able to do that. So certainly um, you see recalls all the time that the federal government announced, that's because they have the authority to recall that product across state lines. Um, a state that does not have a state inspection program would not. So um, hopefully that's helpful as far as what, you know, kind of how we're interpreting these things from the state level. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Laura. You kind of hit the nail right on the head there. So we'll transition into something else now. We're just kind of wondering um, if you know of any resources that can provide startup assistance or expansion assistance and funding available to processors, whether that's in the state of Nebraska or um, on a national scale. So we are, it's a great question. We're having that discussion here at the department. We've asked that question um, in a lot of the conversations we've had with FSIS to say, what are the biggest hurdles plants are facing when they're trying to um, either start a brand new facility or retrofit a facility? And generally it's always the facility. It's making sure your facility passes the sanitation requirements. Um, those things can be very costly. Um, currently in the state, we do not have a direct program about um, money that's available. We have, we've had some of those discussions. 
Um, if this ramp up act were to pass, that would be something that we would immediately start directing those people who are interested to look into that. Um, the one thing I will say from a from an assistance perspective that isn't necessarily monetary uh, here in Nebraska, we're very fortunate. The University of Nebraska has some experts in this area and they have hosted um, conferences with our neighboring states and they kind of have moved them around between Kansas, Iowa, Minnesota, uh, Missouri, and had some conferences that have um, gone through how do you write a HACCP plan? So that hazard analysis, critical control points or standard operating procedure for sanitation. Um, so there have been some of those seminars. Um, there are some experts in the meat extension space at the university. Um, I've reached out uh, Dennis Burson, who has been the longtime meats expert there, who's helped a number of plants in the state, has just recently retired in June. Um, and I reached out to the Department of Animal Science recently just to ask kind of how they're going to reshuffle people there. But I know some of the conferences that were planned earlier this um, spring and summer have been canceled because of the ability to get together with people. But there are a number of online training modules available. USDA has tremendous resources as far as um, a guide for small plants on how to start up. Um, there are plenty of small plants across the country that are in operation. And so um, one of the things that I tell people when we get questions about it a lot is, hey, if you're curious about starting an operation, um, and I don't know if any of you were listening in on the Cattlemen's webinar when we did that, but there was a small processor from Kentucky. He talked about some of the challenges and, and I've told people like find somebody who's a similar size to you, ask them how they got their, um, got themselves started in this and, and what are the challenges and what would they advise you to do. So there are a lot of educational resources, I would say, but as far as funding directly from the state right now, um, there are not um, a lot of opportunities, but I'm hopeful that maybe um, in the coming, in the coming months when some more dollars maybe are made available, that would be something, I think it would be something that would be very beneficial. Great, thank you. And just to make the audience aware really quick, we have one question left and then we'll head into our live question and answer session. So if you have any questions, just drop them in the chat box and we'll answer them after this question. So since the Nebraska legislature just went back into session, I just wanted to ask about any general bills that you first see coming to the table this session that the agricultural community should be aware of. Yeah, I think the biggest, um, without question, the biggest issue that's being talked about that will affect agricultural producers and especially landowners is um, property tax relief. Um, I wish I could tell you that I was super hopeful there is a solution in the works. There are a couple of bills that are being debated. Um, Tensions are running pretty high over at the legislature, and so I'm not super sure what that looks like right now, but there have been a lot of discussions on some adjustments to the school funding formula, which in most rural parts of the state, the property tax dollars, um, largely from agricultural uh, property taxpayers, are what funds a lot of the services, um, you know, anything from some of the money that goes to the counties to um, school. Schools are certainly the largest recipient and um, I'm the mother of two eight-year-olds and I certainly want my schools to be well funded and um, so it's a very delicate balance but I would say property tax relief is one of those issues that we should all be paying to paying attention to and listening to the discussions on to see how that's going to affect us. Um, from the department's perspective um, we're actually still waiting on a couple pieces of legislation but what a, we just um, had a bill signed by the governor on Friday. We did a significant um, rewrite to our animal health statutes, which has been really helpful um, as far as what, you know, a lot of things coming into, into new um, discussions as far as animal ID and disposal of dead animals and some different practices that have changed over the years. A lot of our statutes hadn't been updated for a while. So we did a pretty significant rewrite in LB 344. So that was just signed by the governor. Um, we've also, over the past two years, developed um, this, I don't know how much interest any of you might have in this, but um, with all the discussions in the Farm Bill, um, changing the rules on hemp production for industrial hemp, um, the hemp farming program lies within the Department of Agriculture here. So we've done a few updates to that based on some changes that have happened at the federal level. So um, we are currently, you know, accepting licenses for the new growing season and some growers are, are working on that project. So that is an ever evolving project um, for us as far as when things change. But um, I would definitely say uh, when it comes to agriculture, the tax issues um, are the big ones that um, to follow. I think this meat inspection thing could be interesting next year. 
Um, for cattle producers, there's been a lot of discussion about changes to the brand laws, um, which unless you live in the inspection area and sort of the western third of the state, it's not an issue that you pay a lot of attention to. But um, it'll be it'll be interesting to see when they head into ne next session uh, what their fiscal restraints are and, and how how we go down that road. Thank you. Now we know what to watch for from the other side. Of <laughs> well, thank you for all of your time and answers and. I'm, I know I learned a lot, so um, we'll open it up now to a live question and answer session. Um, Aaron had dropped in the chat box. He asked, does the government supply a federal inspector to any plant that wants one if their plant is up to code, or do some get their request denied? That is such a good question, and we that's a question we've been asked a lot lately. So um, the process for getting, they call it a federal grant of inspection. So once you have a facility that you are ready to make that request from the federal government, um, you submit without question, it's a lot of paperwork, but you submit all your paperwork, you prove to them, um, you know, you have to submit your operating procedures, you have to submit your house plan, you have to submit your work plan, you have to kind of show how you're going to operate, what you're going to sell, how you're going to, how you're going to mark, you know, how you're going to move it through your plant, not market it, but just how you're going to move it through. Um, and then there's oftentimes a lot of back and forth. So you need to fix this or, hey, can you answer this question? There's a little bit more. Um, if a if a operation meets all of their requirements, um, once they are granted that certification, then the federal government has to provide that inspection service. Um, we've been asked that question a lot here because obviously there are parts of Nebraska, we're not unique from a lot of Western states, but there's a lot of pretty remote parts of the state. And so there's been some question of, if we're in the middle of nowhere, do they have to send us an inspector? If you meet the requirements that are granted that um, the certificate of inspection and then allowed to come online, then yes, they do. Um, recently, a plant went online in South Dakota. It actually happened at kind of the start of COVID, a smaller plant that went online is federally inspected, um, not in a huge booming metropolis area, but had met all the requirements and got the um, got the, the process in place. There is a, um, I guess I would call it a grievance provision if for some reason there comes, you come to a point where you're kind of at a loggerheads with, with the FSIS about, hey, I think my process is outlined well when it comes to sanitation. And even if you don't think I'm meeting yours, like, can we discuss it? There is an administrative process where you can appeal to say, hey, I think I've met the requirements. But once that um, has been put into place, they are required to provide an inspector. Um, we've asked the question directly before, and I've heard other states ask it too. Um, is that always the case? And FSIS has told us very directly, if you are under the impression that there is somebody being denied because of an inspector, then let us know because that is never part of our decision-making process. So I think sometimes it feels that way when some plants have a challenge, but if you meet that inspection requirement, then they are required to provide an inspector. Um, another question here is, if a processor is wanting to expand their plant or move to be USDA inspected, what would you recommend? Um, do you, I know you've talked about the university and extension already for a resource, but are there any other resources that you would recommend? So, um, yeah, there are, I think it's always a good idea. Um, we've had a couple of folks call us that have had some challenges and we've encouraged them to get it we've you know there's there's a list if you go to usda's website they maintain a list of all um all of the plants that have federal inspection um hannah that's something i could send to you if it's something that somebody wanted to have um we we keep that list here but you can go to usda's website and see all 6400 of those facilities but i have encouraged people to reach out to some of those plants that are of similar size to those trying to get one done um, there are a number of resources out there. In fact, USDA has a couple of um, online handbooks. They also have a help desk, um, like a small, it's called, I think it's called the small plant help desk. And you can call, I've actually called there to ask some questions and surprisingly, someone answered the phone. And so there's a lot of information on USDA FSIS's website. Um, there's even a mobile app, like you can download a mobile app that tells you kind of in real time as, as plants are online. And when you go to that, if you go to that list on USDA's website and look at it, it shows you 
um, poultry plants, it shows you meat plants, it shows you those plants that are just doing further processing. It also shows you egg processors. They kind of have a lot of different categories. Um, but there's a wealth of information. I Every time I go looking for something, I find myself just reading for days and days. Um, so lots of information out there. And, um, and I think as resources potentially came available financially, um, we certainly will do our part to share those from the State Department of Ag level. Uh, but lots of good stuff from USDA's website itself. Well, yeah, that'd be great if you could send that to me. And then when I send out the recording of this webinar, I may just include that list in there um, in case anyone's interested. And this may be a little less official side, but I'm a part of a few Facebook groups as well that are for meat processors. So that's a great resource as well to learn from if you're looking into getting started. But I don't think that we have any more questions. So um, Laura, thank you so much for joining us today and for all of our audience members for tuning in. If you're interested in furthering, furthering the conversation with CCS about um, processing or expanding your livestock facilities, um, please just visit our website or we'll send you an email after this webinar and reply to that email. Let us know. We'd love to chat about growing your operation, but thank you, Laura. It's been... Thank you, Hannah. Thanks for asking me. I really enjoyed it. I appreciate the, the conversation. If I can be helpful, please just reach out to me. Well, thank you um, to everyone for joining us, and I hope everyone has a great day.